I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. This particular installment is the first of two videos in which I'll be saying some things about William Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet. Here I will focus on the plot conventions and structure of Romeo and Juliet. In another webcast, I'll have some things to say about Shakespeare's poetic language and the relationships among the different characters in the play. I'm particularly interested in the way that Shakespeare uses three elements of plot convention and structure, his use and inversion of the Roman new comedy plot structure, his interest in the possibilities of and problems of communication in the play, and his characters who attempt to manipulate other characters and to control situations in order to produce desired outcomes. So first, the new comedy plot. It's a structure that begins with two young people who want to get married, but there's an obstacle. Their parents object. Also, there's a clever servant or a sympathetic member of the older generation who will help the young couple so that they will be able to elope or in some other way they will be able to get married. Eventually the ruse will be found out and the problem will be resolved. The parents will accept the marriage. They'll get used to it. Sometimes it turns out that the objection was baseless in the first place. Romeo and Juliet begin something like this with Romeo and Juliet meeting at the Capulet's party and falling in love at first sight and then discovering that they each belong to feuding families, so how to get around the obstacle. In the first and second acts, Friar Lawrence aids Romeo, and Juliet's nurse assists her to help them overcome the obstacle to get married without their parents' knowledge. The friar hopes that by facilitating this secret marriage, he can do something to produce peace between the two feuding families. This hope is frustrated. This new comedy structure has to be abandoned when, at the end of the second act, Romeo's friend Mercutio is killed by Juliet's cousin Tybalt, and Romeo, seeking revenge for Mercutio, kills Tybalt. So the friar has to move to plan B. Romeo and Juliet have been married in secret by the friar, and they consummate their marriage, spending a night of passionate lovemaking together. The friar sends Romeo out of town to Mantua to give himself time to sort things out, and he persuades Juliet to feign death, giving her a potion that will put her to sleep to prevent her parents from forcing her to marry their choice of a husband for her, the Count of Paris. From there, the possibility of a happy, romantic, new comedy ending disappears, and the play unravels in the last three acts to the unhappy tragic ending in which Romeo and Juliet each end their lives by suicide. Ironically, however, the deaths of the two young lovers actually produces the end result that the friar was seeking. At the end of the play, with the funerals of their children, the Montagues and the Capulets seem to be ready to give up their long-standing feud. It seems that there will be peace in Verona going forward. Now to the question of communication and the failures of communication. So much of the action of the play depends upon the use of this plot convention. In the very beginning, two servants of the House of Capulet are sent to deliver invitations to a party. But these servants can't read. They're not sure for whom the invitations are meant. So they ask a passerby in the street to read the names on the invitations for them. It just so happens they ask the wrong person someone from the house of Montague. And Romeo, Mercutio, and their friends decide to crash the Capulet's party. That was a fateful instance of misplaced communication. Romeo and his friends show up at the party. Romeo and Juliet see each other, and the rest is history. Well, at least the rest is romance and tragedy. Another important instance of communication failure happens when Romeo's friend Balthazar learns that Juliet is dead and rides to Mantua to inform Romeo. Of course, Juliet is not dead. 
she is only sleeping as a result of the potion given to her by the friar. The friar means for Juliet's parents to think she is dead, but his message gets to the wrong audience. Meanwhile, Friar Lawrence has sent his friend Friar John to Mantua to deliver a message to Romeo that Juliet is only sleeping, that she will be alive, and that he will be able to come back soon and all will be well. But Balthasar's message reaches Romeo before Friar John's message does. So thinking Juliet is dead, Romeo returns, sees her sleeping in the crypt, naturally assumes that she is dead, and drinks the poison. Then Juliet wakes up, sees Romeo dead, and stabs herself to death. Finally, I mentioned the metadramatic aspect of the plot. Critics call this technique the surrogate dramatist, referring to a character within the play who attempts to manipulate situations, to direct other characters to act in certain ways in order to achieve a desired end, often by trying to control messages that audiences within the play will see, as Friar Lawrence has done with his ruse of the feigned death of Juliet. The fact that Friar Lawrence's elaborate scheme to control the situation here has gone so wrong might be taken as a cautionary critique of the power of art, the power of theater, to influence viewers and audiences with good outcomes. And it also suggests the need for caution in the realm of politics. After all, Friar Lawrence is trying to achieve a beneficial political outcome in facilitating the marriage of the young lovers. He wants the feud to end and for peace to reign in Verona. Political leadership and political action in general are in some ways analogous to stagecraft. They depend much on skillful communication. So in this play, as in most of Shakespeare's plays, there's a political dimension to be considered along with the entertainment. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. I'll have more to say about Romeo and Juliet in a subsequent installment. As always, if you have questions or comments, send me an email. Thank you.